Hey, welcome. Welcome back to the people that were watching us with The Wine Thief and welcome to the new um, viewers for a whole weekend of fermented fun. And this is obviously Friday, so we're having a bit of fun with all um, alcoholic ferments. We've just been talking about wine and now it's on to the nectar of the gods, um, which, you know, is uh, fermented honey. So many people have heard of mead, but few have actually had the opportunity to taste the world's oldest fermented beverage that was once heralded as the nectar of the gods. Mead or fermented honey is described in ancient Greek, Roman, and even Hindu texts, and was discussed in detail by Pliny the Elder, Chaucer, and the epic Beowulf. Its roots are ingrained in African cultures with the Khoisan being argued as the first exponents when rock art depicting people drinking mead from the honey tree, dated 17,000 years ago, was discovered. Vince Thompson has created an MCC style mead that is delicious, absolutely delicious. Those of you that attended our fermented pairing dinners will agree it was a real highlight, so unique. Bone dry with high effervescence and just enough floral honey, aroma and flavor. It's really not easy to ferment honey. Ernst has mastered it. Let's bring Ernst in. Welcome, Ernst. Hi, Murray, and welcome everybody else. How are you doing there? How's your Friday treating you? Uh, it's Friday, so it's a good day. <laughs> a weekend day. Yeah, yeah. So I, I just said that it's not easy to ferment ferment honey. Um, uh, why is it so difficult to ferment honey, Ernst? Okay, Mary, I think it's actually quite an important topic, this. Um, I mean, the art of making mead, I think it's been lost a long time ago, thanks to um, making a beer and wine coming online and actually just making it a lot easier to ferment beer and hein, uh, wine and making it a lot cheaper. I mean, honey is just expensive. Um, but based honey, although honey is difficult to ferment, honestly, it's almost just because it's a lost art. Um, all the techniques to ferment honey, everybody has got it. If you can ferment beer, you can do honey. If you can do wine, you can do honey. The only difference is there's a lot more variables that you have to consider uh, when fermenting mead. Um, where a beer malt is relatively stable, you know what you even get. Um, the same with wine, and you can hide wine, differences in wine with um, different vintages, that kind of thing. Mead uh, and honey fermentation is just a little bit more tricky because there's a lot more variability in your honey. Um, and then obviously your yeast. So I'm going to split it in, in, in that sense. Um, firstly, let's talk about uh, honey. So there's two things that you have to remember about honey. Honey doesn't like, and it's very stable, it doesn't like fermenting. Um, so you have to break it down with water, obviously, to get to a, the right amount of sugar um, um, ratio to get you a certain alcohol percentage. Um, but then there's also specific yeasts in honey that uh, like live in honey but they can only start uh, activating when it gets broken down to a certain level um, and then obviously honey is very nutrient poor especially in nitrogen and we all know that that's critical for good fermentation um, so it's all to do with knowing your honey source um, so like all fermentations first things first you need to know that your honey you're breaking it down to the right sugar level um, and then checking pH, which a lot of people don't really do because they can harvest the grapes at the right pH, right sugar level, malt, you know, sort of know what you're going to get out. And you can change it with water like you can do with um, mead. But honey's got different pHs depending on where it comes from. It tastes very different, different times of the year. It's got big seasonal differences. Um, so you just need to start with the honey and make sure that the parameters that you want to start the fermentation with is correct. Um, so you want to start at a pH of, say, 4.5 to 5.2. Um, and you want to add, obviously, a lot of nitrogen. So you have to get the right nutrients um, and also micronutrients. Um, so, yeah, so it, it, it just, it's not hard. Um, it's just you need to know what you're doing. Um, in terms of nutrients, I suppose that's probably the most critical part. Um, like I say, your it's very poor in uh, potassium, so you need to add potassium and a lot of other micronutrients. Um, and then you can just add yeast nutrients like the wine guys do to up the nitrogen. Um, and you should get a clean fermentation. I mean, uh, a more common um, modern threat is to actually slowly add the nutrients in stage approaches over a couple of days um, so that the nutrients doesn't settle out and you, the fermentation doesn't get stuck. Um, now, the biggest thing with this is, is that if honey doesn't ferment cleanly, it does create a lot of off flavors. Um, so if your nutrients is not right, 
Um, the meat doesn't ferment clean. It can take a very long time. You can get seriously off flavors. Um, so it's like I say, I mean, if you're familiar with fermentation, all of these things sound familiar, but it's not something we generally check up on or you don't have the equipment to check it. Um, so, for instance, you can get a honey that's got a pH of eight, which is just way too high. So you need to change that with adding some acidic form of acidity to bring it down in a, in a level where the yeast can actually act, um, can start working. Um, and you can get very low pH honeys, which is three, four, um, um, pH of three or four, which you need to adapt back up. Um, and I think that's the biggest problem. So um, there's this, I mean, and you can use any wine yeast or beer yeast you want to use. I mean, we make a, um, a malt product, uh, a braggart form, which is actually malt and honey mixed. Um, which is actually a good thing because as soon as, so if you're starting off making meat and you don't want to go through the trouble of measuring all of these things and you're not hundred percent sure, the best way to start is actually bringing in other things into the meat. So there's lots of different meat styles. So you can get mellow mouths where you actually add a lot of fruit to the meat. Um, and obviously as soon as you bring the fruit into the meat, you bring a lot of other nutrients back into the meat and that makes it a little bit easier to ferment. It's the same with braggart where you add malt and malt brings a lot of nutrients so it's a lot easier to ferment so just the meat meat plain dry meat like honey water yeast is very difficult to do but as soon as you go to like styles like a braggart you can easily make that at home no problem at all um and that's often also why the reason why your um your meats is taste sweet and that they add fruit to it firstly the fruit helps with fermentation and the attenuation the amount of sugar that gets reduced um into alcohol is, is not very good in most meat, so it can take a very long time. So people stop the fermentation, or the fermentation stop itself because it runs out of nutrients um, at levels where the, the sugar, residual sugar is still quite high. So meat can taste quite sweet. And I think it's all of these things you need to balance and figure out, and the key here is to absolutely get a dry mead. And as soon as you can achieve that, then, I mean, the world is your oyster, because then you truly understand meat fermentation. Um, yeah, but uh, oh, the other thing that's interesting to, to say is that so a lot of people these days start meat fermentations from wild yeasts. Um, so like I said earlier, me, um, honey does have wild yeasts in it that the bees walk over flowers and they bring the yeast into the uh, into the meat, the spores, but it sits there until it breaks down, the water starts flowing into it and it breaks down to a sugar level where and a water level where the, the, the wild yeast can actually um, reproduce and start forming. Um, and I would suggest if this is something you want to do at home, the best way to do it is actually uh, make yourself a starter culture of wild yeast. And that's very easy to achieve like you would do with um, sour bread um, um, or your Lambic style beers. You actually just take honey, break it down to a certain gravity. And I can give all those details if people are really interested. Um, and then just let it sit. Um, and you'll quickly see that the wild yeast take um, effect. And you use that as a start starter in, in your batch. And the nice thing about wild yeast, they like generally killer yeasts. So they will kill all, all the other off flavor yeasts. They will drop the pH quickly. So your product becomes a lot more stable because the bacteria can't get in. So it's a very easy way to start off making meats at home if you just want to make meat. Um, yeah, and, and I think that's it's quite a nice thing to start. Um, just quickly, Murray, I think if people are really interested in meat, um, I just have to mention that South Africa has got the association, the South African Meat Makers Association. And they're welcome to contact me and I can get you onto the WhatsApp group. And if they've got issues or they want to make meat and they want more detail, this group of people are very open and we have got very good frank discussions about this. Cool. I'd like to see what a frank discussion about meat would look like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, it's like everybody's got the style of making meat and the market they target. And all of these things affect how you want to make your meat. Um, for instance, like for us, it's important to get a dry because our product, we want a dry product. Um, so for us, certain details about what we do, of course, is like a little bit secret. Um, and everybody's got their own little secrets, which honey to use, which nutrients to use. But I think Dr. Google is very good with this. You can actually ask it anything. Um, uh, and if you ask the right questions, you'll get the answers. You don't need somebody to help you. But I think... Um, the, what I like about Sama is, or the South African Meat Makers Association, there's a lot of amateur meat makers on there. Um, obviously, I mean, commercial meat makers, there's probably three in South Africa. Um, so the amateurs are the dominant group, and they ask questions, and they answer questions um, from experience and that kind of thing. So it's quite a nice thing to be on. 
Um, you said that yeah. I wanted to ask you before we move too quickly away from it. You said, I think, break down the gravity. So is that taking honey and diluting it to something else when you're uh, basically trying to get it uh, inoculated with wild yeast? Yes. So, so obviously, the, the other component that goes in here is water. Um, and water can also be a big variable. But that's actually where you do a lot of your adaptation. So either you buffer the water for pH and that kind of thing. So when you add the water, your, your, um, your must, your mixture of honey and water is perfect for the fermentation. Um, in terms of breaking it down, so uh, very few people do high alcohol um, meats. Um, again, it, it's not easy um, and it takes a while. So you have to stage your, like I said, the nutrient mix over time. Um, so generally people go for about 8%, um, but I mean, you can go up to 18% if you caught the right wild yeast um, or you've got special tricks to the trade. Um, and you can basically work out that 20 grams of honey is going to give you one percentage point ABV. So um, you can easily just say, I want 8%. So you put 160 grams of honey to a liter of water uh, or fill it up to a liter of water. Um, and then you just mix it and you inoculate it and away you go. But for it to get dry um, and not remain sweet, you're saying that, you know, have the additions of nutrients are important. Yeah, it's, it's when you add the nutrients and how much you add. So what you basically want to do, so, I mean, fermentation, everybody knows fermentation has got a specific curve. So in the beginning, it's very slow while the, the yeast cells multiply and the population grow, and then it speeds up very quickly. And then it gets to a certain point and then it starts slowing down. So you want to basically see, this is the, the honey. So... I'll give you an example. So honey generally, if you've got a very good honey, it's got about 150 milligrams. Uh, I can't. Um, yeah, it's about a, a 150 milligrams nitrogen per liter. Um, and you need about 500 for a good fermentation. Um, so you can then say, okay, good, I need to add, say, yeast nutrient. It's got so much nitrogen. What's the difference I need to add? And you want to add all of that in the first, uh, in the lag phase and also over the, the peak fermentation period. Um, so you can actually just stage it every second day, put in two grams of an yeast nutrient or diammonium phosphate, which is a good one to use. Um, every two days you add two grams till you get it and then you leave it. You don't want to keep on adding because then you're actually creating nutrients for other um, uh, bacteria and stuff. So it becomes a very funny thing. So, um, But generally for the first eight days, you can add your nutrients in the stage approach and you'll be fine. Okay, so um, it was very daunting to me, um, you know, the, the concept of you know, starting to ferment honey. But the more I listen to this is, you know, it's like any other process of fermentation. It's, you know, it's, it's about having the right things in the right place and mm -hmm. giving, you know, nature or the microbes around us a, an opportunity to do the magic, which they, you know, can do um, without too much intervention, right? Except for in this yeah, case, I mean, the nutrients have to be there for, for, yeah. for that. I mean, I think, you know, when, when meat started disappearing, thanks to beer and meat, I think a lot of skill was lost. Um, so, I mean, it got to a point where royalty used to, they, I mean, they still drink mead, um, like you can see on Game of Thrones, and that's got a lot to do with why meat has become such a big thing in America specifically. And the trend is growing globally. Um, the royalty used to be, the royalty class is what, the only people that really was left drinking mead um, from a situation like Friar Tucks, where everybody had a braggart or a, a mead style, a, a beery style mead, um, and it disappeared. And then what ended up happening is that only a few people used to make mead for the, um, or what we call mead makers, mazars. You're only left with a few mazars that made mead for royalty. And they were quite secretive because the only business they had was from the um, from these royal families. So they wanted to maintain their recipes. And a lot of that skill died out. Um, um, but at the end of the day, I mean, being shrouded in secretness doesn't actually help. Um, and if you really think about it, like logically, there's not really that big a difference between uh, fermenting honey over beer or wine. It's just you have to deal with all the variables. And there's a lot more variables than normally. Yeah. Hmm. And, um, yeah, you know, it, it was probably, you probably mentioned it there, but it's, it's, for, for me, it's, you know, honey is not cheap. So I guess it's, that's why it became, you know, the, um, something that you know, the landowning class or the royal class were able to make, whereas people of low income weren't, you know, just being able to get honey. And if they were having their own hive, they can get, can get harvesting their own honey. Sure. But, I mean, it brings up another interesting point. If you look at the, 
the global meat market now, I mean, it's quite big. I mean, we're talking about just over $400 million um, a year. Um, I say big, it's still relatively small in comparison with beer and, and wine. But going from where it was 10 years ago, basically zero to where it is now, and it's projected to grow even faster, um, you can see the problems with, uh, with meat fermentation on, on the products that you see in the shops and international market. Um, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of them contains fruit to help on with the fermentation. A lot of them are sweet because it's very difficult to dry ferment. But also it doesn't really matter because the market they target, the craft market, if you make one batch and the next batch is different, people don't really care because it's a craft market and it makes them come back for more. So how's the new batch taste? Um, does it taste differently from the previous batch? Is it a better fermentation? That kind of thing. So it keeps the market interested at this point. So the difficulty with fermentation is it's actually it's what the market is asking for to a certain extent or it's a little bit of a chicken and egg um, um, argument maybe the market wants that or maybe the market is accepting it because there's no other way so it's a little bit of a tricky one um, but definitely globally it's a very much a craft market they haven't really penetrated mainstream markets um, and I think that's what we're trying to achieve here we're trying to take meat out of just a craft market to like a mainstream actually trying to steal some of the market share from beers and and um, the wine industry. So, so meat is its own category because this is probably quite confusing to consumers and, and including yeah. myself. Is, that, is meat beer? Is it a wine? Is it somewhere in between? I mean, uh, how would yeah. you best describe the category? So, so meat is definitely a chameleon. Um, so as many beer styles as there is, I can make a, a braggart style, which is a, um, a a meat a braggart is basically a, a meat style beer so it's got 50 percent malt 50 percent honey or any ratio of that but generally you need at least 50 percent honey um so as long as the bulk of the fermentable sugars come from honey you should be fine to call it a braggart um and braggarts so i can make a pale ale braggart i can make a guinness style braggart i can make an ipa kind of braggart so as many beer styles as they are i can make as many um uh, as many beer styles the same with cider so you get something called a sizer which is basically just a generic name for uh, meat ciders which a lot of it is apple juice um at which you top it with honey so um again there you've got the nutrients coming from the honey you've got a nice acidic backbone from the apples um and that's actually quite a popular style globally um because it, it speaks to a, a, a already established um taste with ciders um, and then you get all your wine styles is exactly the same. So you can make a, a meat style, which has got 50% uh, Chardonnay and 50% honey or 50% um, uh, Pinot Noir and 50% honey. So you get just as many styles of meat that side. And then, of course, you all get all your meat styles in between, which is just honey, water, yeast. Um, and then they can add spices to give you like a, a, a nice wintry drink, um, a spice mead. Um, this is probably the most famous from Harry Potter, Hogsmeade. That's where the name comes from. Um, they've got the Harry Potter spiced mead is very common. Um, you can look at recipes. So where they take mead and they spice it up to be like a nice wintry and you can warm it up and it's like a glue vine. Um, and then you get all your fruity meads, um, which is what's known as melomels. Um, where you can add basically any fruit to it. So there's so many styles. You actually have to decide where do I want to place this in the market and then target that market and make it in that way. Um, but I do, I am wary because all of those styles, I mean, honey is expensive. Um, and you don't want to make a style where you, it's almost for me a little bit sacrilege to make uh, me that you're actually downplaying the value of the honey. Um, so you want to make a product where the honey is at foremost and you almost get the value out of what honey is. And I think there's a lot of cachet busy um, being built up around honey being about a special, more healthy sugar. I mean, that's debatable. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, it's just the sugar. Um, but I mean, honey does have a lot of uh, health properties that's uh, assigned to it. Again, it's debatable. Um, but also it, it just, there's a health conscious aspect of this. Um, and, I, and I think that is, um, got a big extrinsic value for people to want to try meat and and taste it um, I think the biggest problem I've got as a business is that people generally perceive meat as being quite sweet because of traditional meat styles um, and it doesn't have to be I think that is the, the, the point here 
um, if you really the well, ferment meat well, it can actually be very, very dry. I mean, um, the MMT or the meat method traditional, the bottle fermented meat that you talk about, I mean, that's only got about 2.7 grams of meat per, per liter. I mean, that's right up there with like the driest of brutes um, of MCCs or champagnes. Um, obviously, with, with honey being the core product, it does start smelling quite of honey and that perceives your brain to be a lot sweeter than it really is. Mm. Um, so, I, I, yeah. I guess, I guess with, you, you alluded to it, but I guess with honey, it's less processed than the sugar that, that we, you know, with the table sugars that we usually get sugar cane sugars. Is that, is that a correct statement or am I? No, obviously. Um, I mean, it is less processed. Um, but at the end of the day, your body doesn't, your body sees the sugar in there as exactly the same as, um, as cane sugar. Um, mm. And it's not actually the, the sugar source that's the, that's responsible for fermentation. Um, that it's less processed, obviously. But I mean, it, it becomes a little bit of a debate: is less processed always better? Um, and it's not mm. actually the sugar that's less. If you take brown sugar, which is less processed than white sugar, obviously it's less processed; it's going to be better. But it's not the sugar source itself that's better. It's the other stuff that was stripped out of it. Um, mm. So it's like, for instance, honey is chock and block full of different amino acids. Um, and by like stripping out and like securing the honey. So the, one of the biggest issues with honey fermentation as well is stability. So it can look quite dirty um, um, to a point where like most of your home style meats are quite dirty and there's tricks that you can do to, to get around that like they do with beer where you boil a little bit, uh, boil it a bit to get the proteins off. Um, you can do the same thing with honey, but then of course you destroy all the amino acids and that kind of thing. That's quite good for it. So we try and avoid it in the process. Um, and then you have to start looking at some wine techniques and there's a lot of them like, um, um, bentonite based, um, settlement, settling agents, which settles out most of your dirtiness. Um, it's all about just working with it gently, um, to, to like keep the health properties of the amino acids, um, like, I mean, the pollen in honey, you don't want to strip the pollen out. Um, you want the pollen to stay in there um, and and because that's actually part of the health benefit. So there is a lot of perceived health benefits. Um, some of them are true, some are not. Um, so, yeah, I think there's definitely a value in that. And I think that it, that's what's driving the market at the moment. So are there recipes? Where's the best place to find them? Um, besides, obviously, if you sign up to become a patron of of fermented yeah. and you receive a recipe ebook uh, if you sign up over this week. And, um, yeah. besides that, I like to say, uh, besides that, what else is the best place to find a good recipes for? for me? I, there's so many on the internet. You just need to look for a, a simple, um, easy to start with meat recipe. There's so many of them. Um, and I mean, it is really that simple. Um, the thing is, is a lot of people can't get their hands on a lot of these ingredients, like yeast nutrients. I suppose yeast nutrients you can get at brew shops and that kind of thing. Um, um, like other things you can probably, if you look in the health section in like this game, that kind of thing, you can find some of your micronutrients that you can add. And, and then you sort it. Then it's just a matter of you decide what percentage it should be. And I would try and start low, um, target for eight, and then take 160 grams honey at your um, water and your yeast, and away you go. Awesome. Sorry, kids interfering. <laughs> That's what it's like to be at home. So yeah. Um, yeah, so it's very really simple. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's, so, yes, it is very simple to try and start out. Um, I wouldn't worry about I will use quite a strong yeast. I won't use some of the beer yeasts. Um, I won't mm -hmm. use the beer yeast. I will use some wine yeast, like a champagne yeast. Uh, champagne yeasts are good because they're strong. Kian, please don't. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> good. Um, yeah, I will try starting with champagne yeasts um, uh, or your Vin 13. There's quite a few like of the wine yeast that I would start with as a uh, um, if you don't want to catch your own culture. Uh, I still th probably think that's the easiest way to go uh, about it because then you've got a strong culture um, and you don't have to worry too much about things going wrong because that culture will kill most other yeasts. Um, so then it's just a matter of knowing the honey you're working with. And that's what I said earlier. You need to know what the pH is. If the pH is too high, which it generally is, you need to just maybe add a bit of citric acid that you can buy in the shop or squeeze some lemon juice into it to, to drop the pH a little bit and then you go. 
So you spoke about it being quite diff- another challenge being, you know, it's quite difficult to get the clarity. But if you just see behind our heads, our talking heads, uh, the background, that's actually um, uh, Ernst Mead. And that is liquid gold. It's absolutely beautifully colored um, liquid. Tell us more about your MCC meat, because to me, it was something that I'd never tasted before. And it was almost like tasting, you know, vintage uh, French champagne in its complexity. It's, it's mm. an incredible product. Tell us about the, the process and why you started to go with that. Um, okay, so, I mean, a lot of the reasons we went for the MCC meat is because from the beginning, we realized South African market for meat is quite small. Um, so South Africans just don't know enough about meat um, to, to like go to the shop and if they have to, to pick up a bottle of MCC or a bottle of uh, meat, uh, second fermented meat or bottle fermented meat, which one are they going to pick up if it costs the same? Um, so it's a very tricky thing to deal with. So a lot of our um, initial like target market was international because they know what meat is um, and we wanted to do something nobody else can do. Um, so I put some heavy hitters onto my team to be able to do those little bottles that's lying behind you on the picture. Um, so the primary fermentation, a lot of people can do, but the secondary fermentation in the bottle is quite an art form. Um, so we've got somebody called Matthew Kroner, um, which has got a big family um, connection with basically MCCs, the Kroner family. Uh, and we brought him on and after a lot of trial and error, about two, three years of trying, um, we got the secondary fermentation right to a point where we launched it. Um, and there's quite an art form to that. Uh, uh, I mean, that's much more of an art form than uh, than a science, in my opinion, um, than the basic fermentation. Um, yeah, so we've gone for that because I think we're only the third place in the world to get that right. Um, I see there's another place now in France that's starting to do it, but um, we're the first in South Africa, basically, and the third place globally to do it. Um, it's be- generally perceived as something that's not possible. Uh, obviously, it is possible, um, but that's just because if you don't have a clean primary fermentation, um, you're going to struggle with the secondary fermentation even more um, because then the, the, the byproducts and stuff in the bottle is not conducive to secondary fermentation. So the primary fermentation is still key, but once you get that right, the secondary fermentation is relatively easy if you know how. Um, and then basically what happens, so primary fermentation goes into the bottle with more uh, honey, um, and a yeast culture, um, and then there's something, um, a clarifiant that goes in, which is basically what allows all the, the yeast to settle out. Um, and then it lies for about six months, and then it gets riddled, which is like a normal method champignon where the bottles basically get turned down and they get tilted, so all the yeast settle down in the crown caps, and then it gets frozen, it gets shot off, and then you back sweeten as much as you want, and you put your cork and your hood on. And then you've got your bubbles in it that's made from the yeast, and all the yeast is actually left with a very clear liquid um, at the end. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's a little bit harder to do, um, but it's it's mostly premised on getting a very good primary fermentation, I think. Um, and we've just sent the first batch of these bottles to the UK, so like this is starting to gain quite a lot of traction. So I guess that's a good segue for this question from Eco Furniture Design. And hi there, I would like to purchase and taste some meat when allowed again. Uh, where can I purchase some? So, uh, <laughs> uh, well, it depends where they're at. <laughs> um, so we've got somebody in Joburg that's got stock. Um, so we can supply in Joburg, um, but most of our like supplies is in Cape Town. And a lot of places, a lot of the spas has got it, the tops at spas. Um, the easiest, of course, is uh, Yapi Chef. Um, and I think I don't want to sh- jump the gun, Murray, and take the sale out of your, the wind out of your sale. But I've actually arranged with Murray um, if you want to buy from Yapi Chef, we'll give you a code and you can get 20% off um, uh, to buy it um, if you join Ferment It. Um, I think it's it's great um, for Mary to have organized and, and have these uh, ideas. Um, so you can try it there or you can just contact me. You can just um, Google Maloria. So our, our brand name is Maloria, basically means golden honey. Um, so you can just uh, Google Maloria.com. You can see what other products we do um, and you can just drop me an email and we can arrange it. It's not a real problem. After uh, <laughs> prohibition. Thank you for doing this. It takes the, take the pressure. <laughs> 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 um, I'm just, just going to do that. I'm just going to do your, your, your... Yeah. 
Uh, and yeah, I know you, you've also you also sell it, but um, there's also like Caroline's fine wine. So um, our product is sold quite a lot in the fine wine shops. Um, like Marie alluded earlier, it does have quite a very old French champagne taste, um, and that's got a lot to do because it's fermented honey. And the big thing that gives French champagnes that taste is like the older eyed characteristics that's associated with honey over long periods of time. So we can actually build that up very, very quickly because it is honey. So it definitely has that effect. Um, although old French champagne doesn't generally have a lot of bubbles, ours is still nice and got a good mousse on it. Yeah. No, it's very effervescent. It's beautiful. It's a great palate cleanser. It also goes well with different foods. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've paired it, we've paired it with a, a starter, main and dessert at, at, at our dinners, and they've all gone down very well. So yeah. just to uh, – uh, carry on from um, Ernst's fantastic um, punting of, of of fermented. Uh, if you join and um, become a patron, and you can join uh, uh, by using the link in, in uh, the YouTube uh, description, it is uh, patreoncom slash fermented. If you become a patron of of fermented, you'll get a free merch after three months of being with us, and you will receive a fermented fest recipe book, which I'm hoping. Um, Ernst uh, contributes to. Uh, obviously, he's not going to give us all his secrets because that's hard-earned IP that he's been working on, but just maybe a basic recipe that we can start off at home and experimenting with would be great. Um, yeah, no, we'll we also get, uh, basically, as well as discounts. So as Ernst alluded to, join, we'll get a Yuppie Chef um, discount for you as well. So thank you very much for that offer. I really appreciate the support there. Cool. So yep. MCC. Effervescent bubbles. Um, is there is there a honey terroir? You know, you get grape terroirs. So, is there such a thing as honey terroir? And you know, is it, is it vastly different from the areas from the different bees and the different flora and fauna? I suppose. Yeah, it's very different, and I think that's one of the keys with a commercial meadery. In in very least, you need to actually look for the right honey source based on how much you want to produce. Um, I can't like I can give you a simple example. Fainbos honey. It, it's a really nice honey. Um, although I can add that it doesn't make a great uh, mead because it's just too powerful. There's too many um, very bitter and like um, like flavors in it uh, just because of the, by definition, the flower. But even if I wanted to use that, I can't really because there's just not enough high enough supply that can guarantee me, say, a ton a month or half a ton a month. Um, so the honey selection is quite specific for commercial meadery. Um, and then obviously you need to like know how to get the best out of the honey and i think that's actually the art form um styles where you add fruits and say for instance malt it takes a little bit away i mean you, you can still taste the honey but it takes a little bit away f um, of the subtlety of what the honey tastes like um so one needs to be a little bit careful there but so i wouldn't use uh, i wouldn't add fruit to a very very special honey um and i think yes there's definitely a space for that but you need to have quite a good market because if you're going to use a very expensive honey or very good honey, you need to be able to be sure that you're going to get the price at the end of the day for it. Um, and you need to be quite a connoisseur mead drinker to be able to detect the difference between a Fainbos honey uh, from the West Coast or Fainbos honey from the Eastern Cape or Fainbos honey from um, the Cape Peninsula. So all of those do taste very differently, and we've done the experiments on them. Um, but you need to be quite uh, – firstly, the meat needs to be very good. And you need to be quite a connoisseur to be able to to detect the differences. But yes, it does make big differences, even within a season. I mean, you can have, I, I mean, it's so varied. I mean, even two hives sitting next to each other on a farm, um, one bee colony might have a preference for blue gum honey. The other one will go out in the wild and catch um, or uh, collect a honey f or, um, nectar from the fame ball. So you can have big variations. And I think that's half the art form. Um, how to balance those flavors and make it sure it tastes the same every time. Um, um, like I said, the craft industry is, is thrives on the fact that it doesn't. Um, but for my MCC, I need to be, it's, it's a slightly different story. I need to be able to make it taste the same. So it's, like, it's a little bit easier to control a static um, environment or uh, raw material like grapes than it is to control a bee that can buzz yep. anywhere it wants to. Yeah. And, and, yeah. And for grapes, you can actually still, you don't even have to try. I mean, so with grapes, you can go out and harvest it at the right acidity level and at the right sugar level. With bees, it's mm -hmm. not quite that simple. So because you store honey for longer periods of time, you have to, to harvest the honey at a certain hydration level or dehydration rather. 
Um, so at that point, you have got very little control over how much sugar and and how much, well, the sugar is relatively constant, but how much um, acidity is in there. Um, and then obviously they can, the wine industry can hide behind vintages. So they can say, well, this is the 2018 vintage or the 2019 vintage. It's a lot harder for meat makers to do that. I'm trying, but it's not that simple. <laughs> Yeah. Um, you, you, in the podcast that we recorded, um, uh, the first podcast in Philly actually ever, and you yep. were number one yep. back in the day, and it was called Long Hanging Out. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, so in, in that podcast, I listened to it recently again to refresh my memory. You speak about technology, um, which is strange because it's potentially, you know, is it biotechnology? Is it micro technology? Is it actual like mechanical technology or? What is this IP that you um, you don't have to tell us all because you give away a secret, but maybe explain explain what the technology means. Um, I'll answer that by saying it's D, all of the above. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, it's it's it's. I mean, there's so much technology. I mean, like you see, like a lot of. So I come from a scientific background. I've got a PhD. So like I, I, I'm reasonably well educated. Um, so I can t pick up a scientific paper. Reason and understand. Okay. Um, so a I can pick up well educated a, PhD. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I can pick up a scientific paper and I can read stuff about yeast to understand why, say, for champagne yeast makes more um, sulfur components than other wine yeasts. Um, now, most people won't look at it as uh, technically as that, but that's important for me because a lot of stability. You add sulfur to wines because it keeps the wine stable from bacterial spoilage, that kind of thing. So in a meat environment where you're not allowed or like certain markets don't like sulfur um, and half the, 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 the niceness about meat, uh, especially our product, there's no additives. Um, and the reason we can do that is by, by using specific yeast and allowing it to struggle or not to struggle or do certain things when we allow it to do it or not. So we can actually get a slight amount of um, sulfur coming out naturally um, and we can still claim no sulfur added, which is true. Um, but it does help to stabilize the product in the long run. And we can actually like do things which other people can't do. And I think that's where the key is with technology. Technology is small, small things, understanding yeast to a physiological level. And once you can do that, you can actually use that to your advantage. Um, and I think that's the big thing here. So yes, we do have technology behind us, um, um, but it, it's got to do with all understanding the, like the really nitty gritty details of fermentation. This is not something that anybody, if you're really interested, you can go and read the papers on it and you can figure this out yourself. Um, but if you're just a home brewer, you're not going to do it. Uh, it yeah. <laughs> uh, just a, a quick comment here about Wendy Smith said tasting the meat MCC was one of the highlights of last year's for you have a fan. And then yeah. Eco Furniture has just said that yeah, they're in Western Cape and they know Yuppie Chef, so cool that you're doing yeah. it. And guys, there's also links in the YouTube, there's links in the YouTube um, description uh, straight to um, Ernst's website where you probably do list where it's available, but Yuppie Chef, that's all you really need to know in order for it. Yeah, I think, uh, Mary, I think like last year, Fools and Fans is probably the first time our product really got out there. Um, and I think we we're very fortunate um, the beer community is, is quite a cool community to be in, especially the craft beer community. Um, and I think we were quite mm -hmm. fortunate to win the um, the best craft beer um, there. Um, <laughs> you did. <laughs> uh, you uh, uh, with it. Like people are yeah. like the meat, winning the best craft beer. How does that work? Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's not the first time. I mean, we did the same with the Sommeliers Award because we don't fit in the category and the wine guys really don't want us there. Um, the beer guys mm -hmm. just said, come on, guys, let's just like. Um, and mm -hmm. so that's also where I received the sommelier awards for this product is um, from in the beer category. So we like one of those, the awkward child that nobody wants to, sh to show love. Um, but yeah. <laughs> well, well done. You, you, you're excelling by uh, beating them all. So yeah, good, great <laughs> job. What is, what, what is the future for um, malaria and, and, and meat in South Africa, in, in your opinion? 
I, I think so. We've made strategic decisions in South Africa. So I think like um, forking out 250 or 300 rand a bottle for, for uh, a mead is quite difficult for people to do. Um, and as you know, I mean, we've launched the Braggart, which is slight, uh, well, it's a can of beer um, or a, uh, a mead beer, um, which is a lot cheaper. So people can go and taste for 30 rand. They can get a can and they can taste and say, well, actually, maybe mead, there is some interest there. So let's go and buy a, a bottle of Malori. So I think um, the mead market in South Africa is very much going to go to your fruit meads uh, and your beer style meads. Uh, over the MCC meet. Um, but like I said, the MCC meet was designed for the international market more than for the South African market. Um, although saying that, we're getting a lot of traction in South Africa and we're really struggling to keep up with the South African market and our international um, uh, obligations, if I can call it that. Well, that's good news. Yeah. Um, it's great well, to see a, so, a local yeah. to get international um, yeah. customers and, and be exporting. Yeah, I mean, given where South African industry is at the moment, I think it's very important. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know what the like future is going to hold, and it's quite scary. Um, mm. And I mean, you almost get to a point where you think the international market can't grow fast enough, but then you also look at um, they're also in the same issue. So, I mean, it's not easy. Uh, it's just not easy mm. for anybody at the moment out there, especially in the liquor industry. But the growth in the states or on meat is just it's astronomical i think obviously last time we looked at the stats was beginning some last year sometime has it has it continued that growth i mean obviously removes the fact that you know that the uh, pandemic might influence that. yeah i mean the, the growth is continuing but it's slowing down i mean they've got a bit of an oversupply now so like it, it's becoming a little bit like our craft beer industry year now where like you have to come up with the next weirdest and nicest tasting thing for people to want to try a new product because uh, that's yeah. the key of craft in my opinion um, and i think america, yeah yeah innovation and i think that the um and just because of the cost of the product of, of honey like we said um, and i think in america they've hit that point now um, and there's no real big suppliers of meat in America that makes good quality meat consistently to really target the mainstream market. Um, it's the European market now that's starting to grow very rapidly, like seriously rapidly. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they're going to be in a... Yeah. Sorry, can I continue? No, no, I think they're going to probably be, um, this, uh, in a year's time, two years' time, they're going to be where America was three years' time at the peak of the growth. So the European market, I reckon, is going to really grow. Um, I think it, the biggest thing here is, is like we like mead. If you really think about it, it's, it's very much occasional drink. Um, so you drink, say, for instance, tej when you're sitting in Ethiopia or you've got an Ethiopian uh, meal in front of you. That's when you drink tej. Outside of that environment, it's not something that you would want to drink, in my opinion, um, because it's part of the experience. Um, like uh, meat has got a very big tradition in the Scandinavian countries. Um, and I think that's the same there. It's, it's, you, you drink it in that situation. Um, so there's a lot of markets internationally, but to like, to break that out, it, it's a little bit harder to do. Um, and uh, the craft, that's what the craft beer, uh, the craft meat industry is doing. Um, but there's still some time before we really penetrate the mainstream market, I think. Well, I'm glad that you mentioned Tej because, um, it's obviously in, uh, um, fermented honey from, from Ethiopia. Uh, I was in Ethiopia at the end of last year and had the privilege of tasting it. And you're right, it was a complete experience. Um, lo I actually loved it. It came in like a little um, carafe and I pulled that into a little glass and drank that. And it was all very, you know, it, it was based on, you know, sharing and having a conversation. She shared the carafe and between two of you. Yeah. So I, I, I really enjoyed it. And I also follow a lot of hashtag, mead hashtags on Instagram. And it's, like you say, it's gone crazy in the States and you see all these weird and wonderful um, brands coming out doing exciting things. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm looking forward to, to drinking your product again soon, yeah. hopefully not too long. Um, but maybe just to wrap up, and so what, what's one piece of advice you'd like to give to someone who wants to start you know, fermenting honey at home? Um, I would say... It <laughs> just get on the internet and start reading about a meat. It's fascinating. I mean, I think it's a, a um, honey is fascinating by itself, but meat making is, is just the history behind it. Certain things like the word honeymoon comes from enough honey wine or meat to last your whole moon cycle because it's seen as aphrodisiac. So there's so much good information about meat, which is historically so important and that's all been lost. So I would just like people to know more about meat. Um, if you want to make your own meat, I would say do it exactly like you would do beer. Just, give it a bash. And if you really don't want to take the risk, 
put malt in it and make a braggot. And I guarantee it will work out and you enjoy drinking it um, like you would make a normal craft beer at home. Awesome. Well, thanks for that. Yeah. Uh, get out there and get reading. Ask Dr. Google, the first point of call. Yeah. Or sign up to become a patron and get a recipe ebook with a recipe inside of it. Thanks for the segue. Correct. Um, thank you very much, Ernst. Um, if you want to get hold of these products, like we said, follow the links in the YouTube description um, or Yucky Chef uh, when prohibition ends. Um, support local businesses like Ernst who's doing things that are um, you know, world class. Um, get out there and buy some mead and try it. Um, you will not be disappointed. It's delicious. Ernst, thank you for sharing your knowledge. It's really appreciated. Um, you've been a great oh. supporter of Fermented day one. Uh, it's been great to see your business grow and you can see everybody discovering that amazing product that you've been doing. Have a good evening and a lekker weekend and hopefully you get to watch some of the other um, yep. hosts share their knowledge with you. Same to you, Murray, and good luck with the rest. Cheers, Ernst. Cool. Cheers. Guys, that was awesome. Uh, next one is uh, in approximately, well, um, it's at quarter to seven with fermented cocktails with the guys from Inverush. They've been playing around with different fermented products and ferments to put in with the Inverush gin. So if you would like to join us, um, just pop over to either fermented.co.za slash events or go directly onto YouTube and look for fermented cocktails in our channel. And we will see you then um, in approximately half an hour. So go grab some dinner, go grab a beer, go grab some wine, go grab some mead, go grab some kombucha as long as it's fermented. It's all good. Take you later. Thank you very much.